on this episode of China Unscripted, China's military is deployed for world peace. Biden wants to lift Trump's irresponsible China tariffs and communist ideology's worldwide infiltration. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesta. And let's see, this is just going to be just us this week. So it's going to be... It's going to be fun. We're going to talk about stuff. It's going to be on the rails and then maybe off the rails and then maybe back on the rails. Shelly will bring it back on the rails. I feel like you guys are making fun of me. Well, yeah, Yes, we are. <laughs> are we? I don't but know. It's, it's, a, it's a compliment as well. Because? Well, because you're so good at getting things back on the rails once they're off. It's a symbiotic relationship between you and Matt and I. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. We cause you stress, <laughs> and you stress. Uh huh. Uh huh. I'm good it's at symbiotic. stressing. It's symbiotic. So that's that's why I stick around because like I enjoy stress. Hey, speaking of stress, the Shangri La dialogue. <laughs> what a transition, Chris. Well, I know that was pretty good. I yeah, think. Yeah. So you know that, that the Shangri La dialogue. It's you know uh, it's mostly annual uh, meeting put on by a British think tank, and you know. Everyone's talking this year. Everyone was talking about like you know this Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Do you think that's going to happen? The the, the party like really is ever pushing ever or soon. I, I ever or soon or I, what do you think about the dialogue? Oh well, the the invasion is going to be attempted, but I think after they've done a little bit more to a prepare, uh, which involves strengthening their own strategy and military readiness and doing their best to like de-prepare everyone else, like to infiltrate and disrupt everyone else. Plus they need to do better at redefining certain things so that their invasion of Taiwan is really just this kind of fully legal integration. Well, so I was going to talk about this later, but that's a, a, a perfect segue. Recently, Xi Jinping gave uh, like these new orders to the military to be engaged in sort of non-warfare activities like, you know, world peace. He, he said, like, actually, it's, it's you know, the, the military has to be involved in world peace and also... As militaries are. Yeah, mm -hmm. and engaged in like protecting national sovereignty and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And this is basically creating a legal framework for the military to take violent action, but it not be war... It's actually not new. Yeah. It's one of those things where uh, I think we see this across a lot of things where the Chinese Communist Party has done this before, but they're, they seem to be re-emphasizing certain things right now. Like this is apparently something that was put into PLA doctrine in the early 2000s, the idea of like non-war military activities. Mm -hmm. But Xi Jinping is re-emphasizing it now, right? Like he's issuing this new thing about it. Um, you know, kind of emphasizing about how this is part of the doctrine of the PLA. Mm -hmm. And so I think we've seen similar things about how they're trying to redefine certain things like democracy and human rights, which they've always been doing, but now they're doing it again and stronger. This is such a, a common communist tactic to take words and then just change the definitions into whatever they want. So you think you're talking about the same thing, but you're not. Yeah, China is the best democracy because it is a whole process democracy, unlike, you know, bad democracies with electoral systems. Or, you know, China has the best human rights. They lifted so many people out of poverty while millions are starving in America. Okay. They probably don't say the millions are starving in America it so much. It filters down okay. to all the, the, the Wu Mao and stuff uh, as, as millions are starving in the right, US. Right, but I mean, think about how many... Smart people in leadership positions have praised China for lifting 600 million people or whatever. Oh, no, 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 Matt. It's 800 million. It's 800 million. It's Total 800 lies. million now. They've completely eradicated poverty. You know, Bernie Sanders said China has done more to eradicate poverty than any other country on the face of the, you know, planet, et cetera. Yeah. And, and so, like, like th there's two redefinitions here. So one is is that that is human rights to lift people out of poverty. The other thing they did in order to make that happen is to redefine poverty. Yeah. So they actually reset what poverty means. And I think it's something like less than $1.25 per day. 
But if you earn between that and ten dollars a day, they call it low income, but it's not poverty. And so, and those numbers may have shifted a little bit, but the the idea here, and this is true, is they've redefined poverty so that fewer people are in poverty by a lot. And then the CCP takes credit for that, even though, again, the CCP had put those people in poverty in the first place decades ago. But that's another story. Check out our episode, China's Poverty Lie. Oh, yeah. I remember that. It's, it's like the, it's got the thumbnail of the kid smoking the cigarette. Oh, it does? Oh, that, was, so. that is several years old. So the numbers are a little oh, yeah. out of date. Yeah. But the but the idea is the same. But, right. You, yeah. you, you, you redefine poverty so that fewer people are in poverty. And then you redefine human rights so that lifting people out of poverty is a metric of human rights. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you have the best human rights. Like, like, it's insane if you explain it. But if you don't explain it, it's like, wow, the Communist Party, actually, there's a lot of great stuff in that system. Well, also, you know, because then poverty elimination becomes this big thing that the government is pushing, then anything these local governments do that count as poverty elimination is... Uh, things like, you know, taking Tibetan herders, chasing them off their land, forcing them to go live in tiny apartments in the city. Mm -hmm, uh, the urbanization. Push. Yeah. And then you get all this land that you can develop, right? I and mean, sell off yeah, to yeah. the right, developer. But, but also like nomads are sort of living off the land and they're not necessarily earning or spending cash. Uh, yeah. So they're in so, extreme poverty. So, so they're in poverty, even though their lifestyles might be, you know, decent but then you move them to apartments where they probably have they're materially probably less well off certainly their community is less well off and they might be, is but they work in factories now or whatever so so they're actually contributing to that gdp a lot of people have just been pushed into cities and they don't even have jobs i mean you know like how great was it in in the united states when we got all the native americans off their you know tribal lands and Push, push them into cities. It was well, really- We pushed them into reservations. Reservations. <laughs> reservations. Yeah, we got some of them to see. I mean, but like, like we know how awful the reservation system has been historically and, and continues to be today in the US because we can talk about it. Reporters can go there. Like we know it's really problematic and there are people pushing to fix these things. Yeah. Whereas in but, China, you're not allowed to go to Tibet if you're a foreigner. Yeah, no, you can't no, see it's this. just because- you know, as the Chinese ambassador said a few years ago in an interview with NPR, I think he was like, you know, we it's just because we Tibet's really high altitude. We don't mm -hmm. want people to get high sick. High altitude sickness. Yeah. That's why they don't allow foreigners into Tibet. Yeah, they, they're just looking out for yeah, the, but that, the health right. of the foreigners. But that's a great point, Matt. Like, uh, like we can talk about these issues. And so we know like everything that happened to the Native Americans. No one in the international community or uh, in China, certainly, really understands the plight of the Tibetans or the Mongolians or the Uyghurs. I mean, we're getting a better idea of that kind of stuff, but like... Yeah. I mean, I think the Uyghur situation is a little clearer in part because a number of media who have generally not done a great job of covering China have actually still done a pretty decent well, job of covering the, the Uyghur stuff. Just also, it's, it's, it's also happening now versus like, you know, the right. Tibetans, the Mongolians, the genocide mostly has already happened. Right. Yeah. I mean, like they're putting people in labor camps now. They're blindfolding them and carting them off on trains and buses now. We have the footage of it. So I think that's a big difference. And also like, you know, putting people into apartment buildings in Tibet, like like it doesn't feel like- Oh, well, they did way more than just that. I know, but I'm just saying like, you know, there's no foot, you know, I remember like, like for, for looking at uh, trying to find various footage- to show in our China Uncensored episodes. Like every time I wanna show footage of like what the CCP is doing in Tibet, it's like almost impossible to find good footage of that because there's just so little available, right? And and like that makes a big difference that like when you don't, when you can't really see it, like you just don't, like it just doesn't feel as real. Like it doesn't feel like it's happening in the same way. I'm sure what you said was really important, but I was just so distracted by the reflection of you. I can see through Shelly's glasses. <laughs> She's like, I see two mats. I don't know which one to look they, at. They are very stylish glasses, Shelly. Yeah. You had a point, Shelly? Yeah. Um, I was going to bring it back to the human rights issue and why China, why the Chinese Communist Party is 
re-emphasizing, well, redefining I'm going to bring human it rights. back to the military after that. Okay. So they're redefining human rights again now because of what we just talked about, about how countries are starting to actually push back on China's human rights violations, you know, uh, calling what's happening to the Uyghurs genocide, actually sanctioning Chinese officials, passing laws against slave labor in China. And all this stuff is giving them trouble when they're trying to, you know, put a good face on things and expand. And so the Chinese Communist Party has decided, Xi Jinping just released a paper that he wrote for Qiushi, the Communist Party theoretical journal, about how uh, it's time to win the human rights struggle against the West, basically. <laughs> the human rights struggle. Yeah, no, like they're going to, it it's explicitly says things like how they need to, you know, establish a Marxist framework for human rights, Marxist human rights, mm -hmm. and how they need to both internally and externally educate the people inside China and the world about how great Marxist human rights are, you know, Chinese Communist Party version of human rights, mm -hmm. and how they need to establish, you know, academic institutions, put it in schools, uh, basically like this giant propaganda uh, push to say that China has the best human rights. And brainwash the rest of the world into viewing human rights the way the Chinese Communist Party wants. Yes. Marxist human rights. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't exist. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm trying to think of, of what Karl Marx has said about human rights. I don't remember him ever using that phrase. I mean, you know, Marx talks about giving uh, the workers control of the means of production, right? So maybe that's the closest that Karl Marx actually got to human rights is having the workers in control. But that's not what the Chinese Communist Party wants. Well, they, there's a quote about Marx and Engels. There's part of it because it's the theoretical journal, right? There's part of it that talks about Marx and Engels and what they said about human rights. But it's not – that's not really connected to what they want to do, right? Well, it's because, you know, in the West we view human rights – like freedom belief, freedom of speech, you know, these these liberal rights that we have. The Chinese Communist Party and communism in general is fundamentally illiberal. You are not allowed to have a freedom of belief. You're not allowed to have freedom of speech because you say things or believe things that are not in line or with what the party things, wants. Honestly. Yeah. yeah. So they are creating a fundamentally illiberal human rights standard. Yeah. Which is insane. It is is so antithetical. You know what I'm trying to say. Antithetical to what uh, we believe as human rights. Up is down, well, left is right. Well, that's because that's your, you know, bourgeois Western notion of human Colonialist rights. Colonialist view uh, of Imperialist, human you know, hegemonic human stinky, rights. Stinky. How dare. Every stinky country should rights. be able to define what human rights Based is. Based on their own cultural condition. Yeah, it's right. exactly what the CCP said about democracy last year, that like, no... The people of each country should be able to say whether their country is a democracy and no other country should be able to say as long as the Chinese Communist Party identifies as a democracy, there's a demo they're a democracy. Oh, you know? I'm recognizing this language and so, I, I don't like it. It's, it's very interesting, the argument. And of course, in China, the people means the Communist Party. Well, because the Communist Party speaks for the people, obviously. It's the dictatorship of the people. Yes, the people's democratic dictatorship. Yeah. I mean, some people obviously have the wrong beliefs, the wrong speech, the wrong thoughts, which is why they have to be They're routinely not suppressed. They're not people. Yeah, that's Mao what said. Mao said. So. Yeah. This is this is the world future. Well, so anyways, and to bring it back to uh, the military, that, that original point, like by framing military action from this non-warfare kind of viewpoint, like when China makes a push to invade Taiwan, they're not invading another country. They're not invading another democracy. They are protecting their national sovereignty. Yeah. Or if there's like, he talked about like, you know, disaster relief and aid, maybe there's some kind of, you know, natural disaster in Taiwan. Send the military to help protect the people of I, Taiwan. I don't, I don't think it's just about Taiwan, though. We were talking about the Shangri-La conference. Is, is there anything else you guys wanted to say about that? Well, I mean, I think the interesting thing about the Shangri-La Dialogue is that it is a high-level event that you know countries from Asia and some countries like the U.S. will send their defense ministers to, right? Like the U.S. Secretary of Defense went. Mm -hmm. uh, so Japan's prime minister made the keynote speech. So it's not just 
it's not just policy people, but it's also like a diplomatic event. Mm -hmm. So the fact that so many people were uh, talking about China or hinting around about China's aggression and things like that, like the Japanese prime minister did in his speech, it shows that this is now the issue, right? The Chinese Communist Party is now the thing that everybody is worried about. Yeah. Yeah, I mean this this conference was really important for showing kind of, you know, what the what the pulse is in the international community about China. Um I did some keyword research on on, on YouTube. No one's looking up Shangri-La. I mean, it's yeah. I What is big is Minecraft 1.19 has come out. Yeah, that's the uh Caves and Cliffs Part 3. Yeah, that's the one where you have the ancient cities, right? Yeah. Oh, and the warden. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to be fun. And now we will talk about Minecraft for the next hour. Uh, uh, Shelly, what are your thoughts on the LA? On the what? Ugh. I haven't played Minecraft in a year, at least. Oh, Maybe that's, a year now. That's even before Caves and Cliffs. Yeah, I haven't done any of the new stuff. Oh, gosh. That's because, you know, saving it to be surprised on our gaming channel. Yes, uh, which we'll make someday. So we actually have a very nice yeah. uh, commenter section on all of our YouTube. We we do. I mean, compared to a lot of other channels that talk about China stuff, it's, it's yeah. quite nice. So you guys are awesome. Uh, but I was going to say that that China pledged aid to Tonga in the wake of their um, their is... volcano. Yeah. And so, like, this is how China like gets those inroads. So, but and I think that's that's one area of concern. And because we're talking about the Shangri La dialogue, I don't know if you mentioned this. It's because it's held at the Shangri La Hotel in, in Singapore. Singapore. Like yeah. it has nothing to do with that place in Yunnan province that China renamed Shangri-La. Or White or, Fist. Or, White you know, fist. some kind of- Iron like Fist. Historical. <laughs> oh, I, I, Iron I, Fist. I, Iron I, fist. Made some, I, I made some social I, commentary I, about that. Excuse I, me. Uh, well, I, that is yeah, kind of funny that, that you- funny. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Uh -huh. it, it, it's, it's also arguably like the worst of the Marvel series. And so it's understandable. You see, this it's is how it's this is great how we get on the rails, off the rails. We went off the rails, Minecraft, right. back on the on rails, and now we're back off with we're, Marvel. We're, we're off. We're talking. We're, off. we're talking about about White Fist. White Fist. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, is this a band? I don't know what. <laughs> White uh, Snake. So so well, okay, Sh Shangri La something dialogue. Oh, yeah, like all these defense ministers. And equivalents, as well as like uh, the prime minister of Japan, you know, talked about, I mean, without saying China, but basically about China and like all this aggression. And so, so what this shows is this real sea change politically in. <laughs> yes, what? Shelley, do, what you, happened? do you have something to say? I feel like I said that five minutes ago. That's why I'm laughing. Sorry. No, no, no. It, it doesn't count until I've mansplained it to you, Shelley. I, I never listened to Shelly, so this is new information for yeah. me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, so so, so I, I'll, I'll pick us up while Shelly has her laughing fit. Uh, so this is also this why is... it's so scary that, like, you know, with the, the, this framework, see how I can just ignore Shelly and just keep yeah. talking? No, keep, keep, talking. Keep, the keep talking. Keep the camera on uh, Chris. Uh-huh. Uh, Keep it, keep it on Shelly for this entire, entire intelligent thing I'm going to say. <laughs> this is why it's so dangerous. You know, Xi Jinping talking about like you know non-military action. Like they're 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 trying to establish uh, a base on the Solomon Islands, uh, all throughout the Pacific. So you see that China putting its military around, uh, you know, the South China Sea with the military bases there in the Pacific. They are spreading their military out. And as much as Xi Jinping says it's not for war, they are gearing themselves up. And and again, do not take the camera off of Shelly for any of my discussion. <laughs> oh. Here, Shelly. I hope that was as much fun for you as it was for Shelly, because we're all about fun here on China Unscripted. <laughs> did, did you what? always have your horribly stained handkerchief on the table? Well, uh, yeah. Thanks. You know, Matt. you can you can keep this. Thanks. We're we're gonna probably do this to you again at some yeah. point in the next you know remaining. That almost never happens minutes. to me. Mm -hmm. What? Uh, all right. The next thing I want to talk about is you know the Biden administration has been signaling it wants to uh, uh, revisit some of Trump's quote irresponsible 
tariffs on China. Which uh, ones are responsible and which the, ones are irresponsible? They, they don't say. Um, and this is supposedly to fight inflation. I mean, but, I can believe that they are grasping at every possible straw. Well, right. the, the thing about the doing something about the tariffs is that is something that Biden has the executive power to do. He doesn't technically control the Fed. He has limited things that he can actually do. So this is one of those things where he can say, like, I removed tariffs and that's been good for the economy. Um, right. Well, I mean, if, if, if Biden removes Trump's tariffs, then the prices of importing goods from China that you buy, for example, through Amazon.com will go down a little bit. So you can get cheaper products and more sales on Amazon.com. Coincidentally, the Washington Post has been... Uh, also pushing this idea that we should get rid of Trump's tariffs. I think that's a coincidence, though. Coincidence because Jeff Bezos owns the Washington Post. Yes. Just in case that wasn't common knowledge, which I don't think it is. It's really disturbing how many billionaires own our media. Jeff Bezos owns Washington Post. Carlos Slim, a Mexican billionaire, owns the New York Times. Uh, Michael Bloomberg owns Bloomberg. Hey, well, well if, if inflation continues the way it's going, pretty soon there's going to be billionaires you know, owning this show because we'll all have billions of dollars. I don't think we're going to get to that level, but... Uh, yeah, that's, that's, we will be that's eating like Zimb each other. Zimbabwe levels of inflation. Yeah. yeah, that is, you must weigh your money <laughs> like when you pay for things because it's yes. not worth counting it anymore. Yes. Yeah, I think it is a political score. Like they will try to remove some of the tariffs because they want to be seen as doing something about inflation. Now, the U.S. Trade Representative, Catherine Tai, has come out saying that it's not really going to help. Yeah. But Janet Yellen, Treasury Secretary, who was totally wrong about inflation, who said it would be, you know, transitory, nothing, just totally wrong. She seems very supportive of the idea of removing tariffs. Can I, can I talk about Janet Yellen for a minute? Oh, no. Matt's going to go on a rant about the Fed. Are you, are you, are you saying he's going to be Yellen? Oh, ooh, ooh. See, look. I don't know if you so, like that or didn't like that. I know. I think I was of okay, two minds. So, so, so Janet Yellen is the Treasury Hold Secretary. Hold on. He's getting the soapbox out. Get it, get it, get it, get on it. Look, she was chair of the Federal Reserve from 2014 to 2018. You don't become chair of the Federal Reserve unless you understand better than almost anyone how the money system works, right? Like really works. She was also a board member during the um, the quantitative easing period that came after the 2008 financial crisis. Mm. So, so she understands better than almost anyone uh, how inflation works, what the relationship is between bailouts and interest rates and inflationary pressures, whether it's asset inflation or, or consumer price inflation. I'm all about that asset inflation. Right. Well, I mean- You and Wall Street. <laughs> yeah. Right. So asset inflation is when like things like stocks, uh, real estate, other things go up. Also now like crypto and, and NFTs. And yeah, stuff. that's what I'm all about. Yeah. So like we're seeing not just consumer price inflation, which is at like 9% or something, but we're seeing uh, asset inflation of those other things. Obviously, there's been recently a big dip, but those are going to go back up because if they dip too much, the Fed will bail them out again. So this is the whole thing. Like she understands how it works. And she understands how, like, too much money gets created uh, through the banking system. And so for her to say that, like, oops, I didn't see inflation coming is, like, either she's totally unqualified for the position she has and had before, or she's being disingenuous. I wonder which one it is. Yeah, and I, I don't know. It's very, it's very hard to say. Really? I No, it's not hard to say. I just didn't want to say it, Shelley. She she's lying. She's a she's a smart woman. She's a very, very smart woman. Um I'm a little disappointed. I, I really was expecting like, like almost an Alex rant. Jones level rant. I think Matt was I, very I was, tightly I controlling. Was, I was toning yeah. it down. Why? Because I mean, do people really want to hear about the Fed and how it they They want to see money? your emotion displayed. Anyway. Look, the the Matt is uncomfortable with emotion, so let's move on. Yeah, thank you, Shelley. <laughs> the the Fed the Fed screwed up. Uh, the Trump administration and the Biden administration both screwed up by essentially putting pressure onto 
do too much deficit spending during the pandemic. The COVID pandemic relief yeah, bills. I mean, and... tr- Trump had like a ton of deficit spending in his last year. Biden not only picked that up, but added like new stuff to deficit spending. Well, because the lesson that they learned from like the Trump administration doing deficit spending was they're like, hey, it didn't blow up the economy. We can push this even harder. Like we were, and thank yeah. goodness for Joe Manchin uh, killing the Build Back Better bill. Because imagine how much worse things would be. And he killed it because he was worried about inflation. Yeah, and I, at the time, people were like, "Oh, that's stupid." Yeah, yeah. there's no such thing as inflation. Well, not no mm. such thing, but I mean, there 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 are people who believe that like the government can essentially print as much money as they want, and it doesn't lead to inflation. Yeah, like that is. That's is that wrong. Mon- is that modern monetary modern theory? Modern monetary theory, yeah. But like but but it's wrong. So it's just flat out wrong. Uh, it doesn't mean that there aren't certain true elements within things, right? Like because it's obviously more complicated than that. And anyway, it's also more complicated to said the to say the Fed prints money because they don't actually print money. Uh, and they don't actually just issue money either, right? And even the Fed's buying of deficit is it's more complicated than that because it's actually the banks themselves, which are yeah. Well, I, th- I, I, you, you said it pretty well the other day that like it, it is purposefully complicated so the average American doesn't understand what's happening. Well, I mean, I think yeah. it's also complicated because that's how the system is set up, but nobody's right. trying to explain it to people. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the banking system is like, like w- w- when you kind of get into how banks operate and like how they make loans, like it, it's, it's so absurd that like... Y- you have to just like, okay, like banks don't make loans based on how much money they have in the bank. They make it based on the interest rate from the Fed because they can borrow as much money from the Fed as they need to cover for the loans they're making. So they make however many loans that they can make that they think are good investments. And they just borrow the money at cheap interest rates because the Fed keeps them really cheap. But the impact of doing all those loans is to add all this money into the economy. And so that's like, that's what we've been seeing. And so that's like things that create inflationary pressure. And if that's a little bit confusing, it's meant to be confusing. It's meant to be confusing because if we all understood how it worked, we'd be like, this is like not okay. Well, it's because it's totally removed from how like normal people function with money, where it's like you have so much money and like you can't just like magically spend 10 million dollars you don't have right but but a bank can loan out 10 million dollars it doesn't have yeah because it can make a loan at say 4% and it can borrow money from the fed to cover at at a lower percentage so the point is removing trade tariffs with china is not going to address the fundamental issues of inflation. Thank you, Chris, for bringing us back on the rails. That's what the show is all about. Uh, What is very interesting about this, though, is like all of the labor unions are like telling Biden, don't do this. Uh, Don't take the tariffs off? Don't take the tariffs off. And this is is where like, you know, politics gets really weird because, you know, this is all about, you know, the American workers uh, in labor unions. Like these are are the people that Democrats usually uh, like, uh, say like they're the party of. Yeah, but remember like when Clinton wanted China to join the World Trade Organization two decades ago, like it was a lot of labor unions were opposed to that too because they they saw what was going to come and they were reassured, of course, by the Clinton administration this was not going to happen. But the workers are like, yeah, you open this up to China and we're going to lose our jobs. And Bill Clinton in his very charming way was like, you know, don't worry about it because we're going to be selling more to China than we're going to be buying from China. Oh boy, was that wrong. Everything he said was wrong. Yeah, I mean, it's it's not that, that U.S. corporations didn't also want to sell stuff to China. They did. But it's just that they wanted to buy cheap from China and sell American stuff to China. That's what the U.S. corporations wanted. What the Chinese Communist Party wanted was to sell stuff to America and get American companies get to come to China and steal. Uh, steal their stuff. Steal their stuff. Right. They had very little interest in buying American things. Communist bandits. That's a great term. We need to use more. Mm. Where, where did that come from? I feel like... Uh, I think it was something uh, Chiang Kai-shek referred to the, the communist bandits a lot. I forget where the term actually originated from, but yeah, like 
That's a term we need to bring back. Mm. Communist bandits. I want to see that on Twitter a lot more. I think that YouTube was censoring that term or something a while ago. Oh, yeah, the there was something section weird. Where people were trying to type it in Chinese and people were getting... So, yeah, it was yeah. in Chinese or weird. something. Yeah. Communist well, bandits. But at any rate, like, you know, the, the, the labor unions were right in the 90s that mm. this was going to be bad. And then it got bad. And, that, and then Trump, like, ironically, it's Trump who was like, you know, we're going to put the tariffs on China. And then actually it helped to some degree. You, I mean, at the same time, employment went up in the U.S. And it's complicated. And you can't say it was just Trump's doing with the tariffs. But like that was one factor. And then weirdly now it's biden who wants to remove them but like the, the i don't think the biden administration would be talking about it now though if it weren't for the inflation yeah because i the, think there's been a lot of pressure on the biden administration to remove the tariffs from the wall street Jeff yeah Bezos people who want to do business in china uh but they've so far held off They've always been very, the whole China policy has been very wishy-washy. Like he, he never said what he wanted to do with the tariffs uh, in the um, campaign trail. And then. I mean, I don't think he could have in the campaign trail because that would be like. ambiguity. Well, it would be like saying that Trump was right about something. And, you know, if you're running against Trump, that's not something you want to say. <laughs> you don't, God forbid politics is like, you know, we're all Americans. This guy has some good ideas, but, uh, you know, we can all work together. It's like what Elon Musk said recently on Twitter that he was thinking about founding a a like centrist moderate pack that just supports centrist moderate candidates from any party. What a far right white supremacist. <laughs> uh, just like uh, well, An Andrew Yang, you know. <laughs> biggest white supremacist there is. Well, next to like uh, Larry Elder. Mm. Uh, I was going to say Tulsi Gabbard. Well, are, yeah. Larry, was she ever called a white supremacist? I thought it was funnier when Larry Elder, Larry, Larry a Elder, conservative black uh, gubernatorial politician, candidate. gubernatorial, yeah. yeah, was called the you know the the black face of white supremacy <laughs> by the Los Angeles Times. Uh, we live in clown world. Okay. Well, anyway. Anyway, Let's get us get us back on the rails, Shelley. Well, that was related to the rails because it's it's it's, it's Re related, related to the rails. rails. You heard it on for the rails. <laughs> It's adjacent to Run, the rails. Adjacent. It's next to the rails. Okay. Yeah, rail adjacent. <laughs> okay. Because it's related to the rails because. Uh, because the the idea is like the Biden administration has is really talking about uh, getting rid of some tariffs, and they're framing it as like these irresponsible Trump tariffs because that's the way you sell. They'll something. keep the responsible Trump tariffs. Oh right? yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's also interesting because you brought up uh, Bill Clinton and the whole WTO thing, Matt, and I think. Basically, there was just a lot of trust that the WTO could reign in China, right? That if China really wanted to join the WTO, then the WTO could make sure that there was a fair playing field for all the companies going China into China. China follow the rules. Yeah, yeah. Instead, what did China do? The Chinese Communist Party just took over the World Trade Organization. Just so like they, did the WHO. And the UN. So there's just... The idea that we can somehow get the Communist Party to normalize under the rules of the international order is I just mean, laughable. Like you talk about the WTO, the WHO, and really China is dominating the WTF. <laughs> I felt like it was going somewhere. That went somewhere. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it did go somewhere. I thought that Thanks, was Thanks, Chris. I thought that was good. Anything more to say about tariffs, inflation? Um, more yelling, Matt. Yeah, no, I don't think I'm going to do any more yelling, but I will say that um, we'd be better off economically bringing jobs back to the U.S. from overseas, including China, but also including other you know, developing nations. And if we were to do that, the inflationary pressure wouldn't be as bad because you would, even if inflation continues you'd have wages keep up when you have more manufacturing here. So I think if the Biden administration is thinking long-term, it's it's less politically savvy, but certainly more economically apt to focus on private U.S. manufacturing uh, coming back to the U.S. and supporting small business and competition in the U.S. 
uh, to just basically help the employment market. I don't think it's just about employment, though, because the employment market is kind of messed up here right now anyway, because there is still a lot of demand for employment that's not being filled. But I think one of the causes of inflation is the supply chain problems, right? right? Like the whole idea is like, oh, well, if demand goes up and supply can just catch up. And right, right now we're having a lot of issues with uh, the supply chain, a lot of it China related because of the COVID lockdowns and things like that. Which, which on that topic, like this goes back to what we talked about last week in the podcast with Ian Easton, just how China has so much control over the, you know, the supply chain from the Chinese military tied companies controlling the cranes in U.S. ports. They really have a devastating chokehold on the American economy because of their power over the supply chain, which will get worse if the Chinese military in their non-military action controls the South China Sea, Taiwan, Pacific, all the shipping lanes. And there's essentially no part of the supply chain that is not controlled by some foreign entity. So like, you know, we're, for example, we're reliant on Canada for some of our oil. Right. And like, that's not so bad because we have a very good relationship with Canada in general. Uh, but still, like, you, you got to consider that that even our allies can be heavily influenced by China. And so, like, I, I'm not opposed to doing trade with, with other countries. It's just that the, like, oil is a major part of basically every supply chain, right? Because even though the U.S. produces a lot of oil, we still because of the way the refineries are set up and so on, like we're still importing a lot of oil. And so the like oil for transporting things from one site to another is part of the supply chain and that can get screwed up. And then China can influence a country that's uh, part of that supply chain, right? And so you've got this like very complex interconnected system. And like, unless we start to rein that in and become more, self-sufficient. I don't think we need to totally be self-sufficient, but at least on core things, like we, we got to be self-sufficient. Otherwise, you know, China's zero COVID lockdowns are going to continue to screw with our supply chains now. And the next thing they do five, 10 years from now is going to screw with us again. It's not just the supply chains. Like, uh, you know, we, we are delayed in getting some stuff from China, but they will weaponize that remember the whole made in China 2025 thing mm -hmm. and they were going to go for high tech um, stuff and for microchips and things like that. And there was a big backlash and they were like, oh, they canceled. Like they basically well, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't cancel, cancel it. it. They unbranded it. Mm -hmm. Basically, they stopped talking about made in China 2025, but they pushed forward uh, even faster with some the, those initiatives. So basically, they're trying to catch up in the in the tech world so they can have a mon monopoly over that. And th they've made real progress from that. I mean, I think I think Huawei's involvement in 5G globally uh, is a part of that. And it may not be branded that way, but it is, right? You, you've got Chinese companies involved in the, the telecom network and the internet networks uh, all over the world, especially in these developing countries that didn't really have alternatives. And so like, this is part of Made in China 2025, They've got their their computer chips all over. Well, and I mean, they're not that good at computer chips yet. I know, but like, it's not 2025 yet. I think- And they've got three more years. They've got three Two more years. Half. Yeah. And then, you know, if they if they take Taiwan, they, they control those computer chips. And I'm not sure they'd succeed in taking Taiwan, which is a whole separate issue. But like, they make really rapid progress. And like, it's sometimes shocking to just look back and be like, wow, things were so different just like two or three years ago. Yeah. I mean, the Chinese Communist Party is basically willing to throw money and resources, like when it decides it wants something, right? Like then everything pivots to fulfill that. So in some ways they'll get companies that are actually good and then they'll get a like bunch of terrible companies that never actually produce good quality, anything, and it's a waste of money. But they can still, they'll they'll tolerate that so they can get like the one or two companies that become Tencent, right? Or become these giant, right. become um, TikTok. You know, they'll, 
they'll take all the the that so that they can get those ones that are going to become Huawei or whatever. Which you know might sound appealing to some people. The idea that like oh the the, the state can decide to do this and like something um, like will get done. Uh, but like you know everyone keep in mind like the Chinese economy runs on debt. It's just one giant debt bubble that's going to burst at some point versus like a free market where people are incentivized to create companies that function. I mean, it wouldn't, the Chinese Communist Party would not be able to do things this way if we were not giving them money. Yes. If right. we had not been giving them money since the late, like the 90s, essentially, we've been funding their rise. And uh, yeah, it's, it's. Yeah. It is terrible. And, and this is like something I think a lot of people in the West get wrong. Like they see this system and they're like, oh, that's great. You know, well, well, we in America are like, you know, bickering back and forth and can't get anything done. You know, China can just, you know. But of course, they steal a lot of that technology. So I'm saying those one or two in. companies are not like necessarily the most innovative. It's found a way to bribe some employee the, the, the ruthless from. ruthless and the most loyal to the party. There was somebody who found a way to bribe some employee from TMS, the TSMC, and mm -hmm. then like stole their chip data or whatever. Yeah, yeah. It's mm -hmm. it's not necessarily that like it's actually or even the high speed rail, right? Mm -hmm. They stole that from Japan largely. So it's it's not that they are the most innovative or anything. It's just that they can get the tech. Mm -hmm. uh, which reminds me, like the U.S. ambassador to China has sort of been on like this like propaganda kick on Twitter talking about like China's great high speed rails or like, oh, isn't it great that uh, the Chinese Communist Party has uh, preserved uh, the Forbidden City, such a cultural gemstone or something. And it's it's like, it's just like, what what is going on in this administration? He's trying to be a diplomat, right? I, they're, they're focusing on diplomacy. Yeah, diplomacy is not constantly praising an authoritarian genocidal regime. Actually, there uh, was a recent... It is. Is, it's Burns, right? And the ambassador? I think so. Yeah, like there was actually a recent quote for him, something about how... I can't remember the exact quote, but it was kind of about how China has been excessive. Like it's it's done, it's gone too far in a certain thing. And so... The f the funny thing about that, I think Christopher Balding tweeted it with this um, about how it's like saying that John Bundy has exceeded the uh, number of allowable murders for a, a serial killer or something like that. Just just the idea that oh well, if China didn't do some of these things so excessively. I mean, it would be okay. Countries are allowed some, you know, breathing room for how many people they kill within their country. It's just, it's just part of part of the game. Just a, as long as you know, you keep the genocide reasonable, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that the the what the UN human rights chief essentially was saying when she, she came back from her oh, tour her, yeah. of like the UN human rights chief. Michelle Bachelet. Bachelet, she came back from her China tour. It, Which right? was not an inspection, she said. And she wasn't really able to see everything. There were limits, et cetera. And then she basically bought into the Chinese Communist Party framing of what's happening in Xinjiang. That like, oh, it's about counterterrorism. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and this is another woman who has had a long connection with like socialism and communism. But she was saying essentially that their counterterrorism policies need to, like they need to re-examine those policies to make sure that they fall within international norms. And... So <laughs> this goes back to what we were saying at the beginning of the podcast about just how, you know, uh, the communist bandits will take words and like just reframe, well, they'll reframe things, change the narrative about things. And so suddenly you're talking about completely different things and they're just remaking. But then the they get the UN to accept that framing, right? Well, I mean, it's because a lot of people in the UN have also grown up under, you know, socialist or communist countries were hold these beliefs. They're keyed into this worldview. I don't think it's just that. I think it's also that um, they've spent 30 some years trying to take over the UN and that, people haven't noticed. That's true too. But I mean, like Michelle Bachelet, like, you know, she, after Pinochet took over Chile, which was her father was in the government, they were 
tortured. She fled to Australia and then decided to go to East Germany. So, like, it's not China that, like, made her, her, her go to East Germany. Like, she is already keyed into this. And there are people like this in positions of power all around the world. It's a problem. Like uh, Chesa Boudin, San Francisco. Like, that's a great example. Parents were in the weather underground. This was a San Francisco attorney general responsible for the crime wave by not persecuting petty crime. Not prosecuting. prosecuting. Thank you. <laughs> a little uh, different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When I said it, I was like, something's not right. But yeah, his parents were, you know, in the weather underground and spent their lives in oh, jail for Boudin murdering. was a big fan of um, Hugo Chavez. Yeah. Well, he's a translator in Venezuela. I mean, he specifically... Like congratulated Hugo Chavez, worked for the presidential palace. Like congratulated Hugo Chavez for abolishing term limits, et cetera. Yeah. So God, term limits are so undemocratic. It wasn't a secret that he had, uh, you know, more radical ideas yeah. about. Well, once upon a time in this country, a guy like that would not have been elected to office. But as Karl Marx said, the specter of communism is ruling the world. I feel like it. It would have happened in San Francisco before. Yeah, maybe. Like San yeah. Francisco in the seventies would definitely have elected somebody like Chesapeake. Yeah, San Francisco. That's, yeah. that's true. It's San Francisco has been a funny place for a long time. But yeah, in a lot of ways, even though we were not alive in the seventies, if you look at back at a lot of the things that were happening in the seventies, it feels like a lot of the same things. You see the the mark of communism in a lot of places. Right. Well, I mean, I, communist ideas began to spread in the the late 60s, early 70s in a, I mean, you could trace it back further, right? Oh, you talk about the, beatniks in the 50s and so on. Like you can go back as much, but like- The Frankfurt. The Frankfurt mm -hmm. School. Yeah. So, okay. So, so yes, you can go back and look at that. But I would say that, that it was really the 70s when it started to become more and more mainstream and okay to have communist ideas and not have people laugh at you for being stupid. Oh, the long march through the universities. Right. And so the, the students of the 70s became the professors of the 90s and the 2000s. And now you have another a new generation where basically like there's now been one to two generations of very radical uh, people in academia and increasingly in leadership positions in elected office. And, you know, while I do think that it's good to have a spectrum of views, when the spectrum includes people who are heavily influenced by the Chinese Communist Party, that's the part that I'm super concerned about. Well, I think this is why Xi Jinping, in his whole speech about human rights, was like, we need to make sure that our you know, this Marxist human rights framework, we promote that, we set up academic institutions for it. Like we promote that in schools, right. et cetera, because that will also influence the outside, uh, you know, academia in other countries when they it, when right. they study China, right? Like Wherever, when you like work you, with Chinese universities. Yep. You have like, you know, uh, your, your alma mater, NYU, Chris, like mm -hmm. has their Shanghai, their Shanghai branch. branch and. Like it's hard to see that not being influenced to some degree. Oh, please, uh, yeah, that's totally, yeah, terrible. Yeah. So, like, yeah, it's just, it's just, it just seeps in slowly, and like we don't have a mechanism in this relatively free country to, uh, to to stop that very easily. I don't think it's like we don't even have a good way of exposing it in a certain sense. It's tricky because like you always get the like, oh, well, you know, that's not real communism. That's how communism is. And it's it's this whole like changing definitions. It's it's so mercurial that it's hard to uh, like for just like a normal rational person to like articulate the problems with it because it gets so, it creates its own weird internal logic. Well, it's also very hard to, if you actually read, like I was trying to read um, the Chosha article that mm -hmm. uh, Xi Jinping wrote, and it's dense, right? Mm -hmm. It is full of, um, you know, the title was something like "Unswervingly Follow the China's Human Rights Development," blah blah blah. You know, it's mm -hmm. just very pseudo intellectual, and but like it's full of that type of essentially communist theoretical language in Chinese. 
Yeah. So it, it, it add that on top of it. So it's Chinese. People, you know, a lot of people in China when they everybody in China when they go to school, you have to have a class on Marxism, Leninism, every grade. And nobody wants to read that stuff because it is just all like dense, unreadable stuff. Uh, and it's hard to even make sense of what it's saying. Mm -hmm. uh, for most people, they just kind of like glaze over and try to make it through the class because you have to for political reasons. Like, you know, if you want to get into college, you got to pass the Marxism-Leninism classes. So basically you're saying that by making subjects really opaque and boring, like that's their it's like superpower. Like that's how they get stuff through. Sounds and like think... the Fed. <laughs> oh, oh. Ooh. Well, I think that that's what Ian Easton was saying on our podcast, that they can directly say some of these things and people aren't paying attention, right? Yeah. Oh, right. Because he was like reading some of their original stuff and translating it. And she's like, yeah. He's like, yeah. Like, like no one else is even translating these things. Where they say, we are trying to spread international communism. Yeah. Amongst other wonderful tidbits. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. Just like, hey, we won't, we won't translate it. It's, they'll never know. <laughs> Actually, there's like that weird feeling that uh, remember when the Chinese Students Scholars Associations a few years ago were getting in trouble for their links with the Chinese consulates in the US. Mm -hmm. There was this weird arrogance about how like they weren't trying to disguise any of it in Chinese on their websites because it was just like they assumed that nobody would bother trying to read the Chinese. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's, what's the solution? I guess read Ian Easton's book. What's the solution to what? The, the 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 problem Everything. problem is the communism. What's, what's the solution to the, to the communism? <laughs> to the communism. There's 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 so much communism. And, uh, and that's... <laughs> oh no! I think I think we might need to start wrapping up. There were yeah, more things we is, could talk about. This no, let's, seems let's, let's, like let's talk about. I just I just feel like like this overwhelming sense of communism, um, where it's just infiltrating everywhere. Which which is true, and it's it's a it's a problem that has existed for a long time, and I don't know if anyone has a good way of really combating communist ideology, because the real risk is to just say, "This is crazy; it's never going to take hold," and then look at China. Right. He got people; he got students tearing up grass because it was bourgeois. Mao Zedong. Mao Zedong. Right. Yeah. He got people to kill sparrows. And everyone else in the country. That's true. Kill the landlords. So it's it's like the scary thing of like, this seems too crazy to actually become a thing. And then your country falls to communism. How do you, so how do you actually right. defeat these ideologues, this ideology? And I was just thinking after I was just a moment ago talking about like, oh, there's like so, so much communism. I, I, I don't want to sound like, you know, Senator M McCarthy, right? Because like, you know, just to say that, oh, there's like this thing, this communism, blah, blah, blah. But like, there's all these these ideas that come from Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, and now Xi Jinping thought on whatever, that, that are like, they're, they're subtly changing things from the way that our academics and elected officials talk about China, such as human rights, uh, to international law, such as how China is going to operate around Taiwan and the South China Sea. I mean, look at the change from people talking about equality to equity. Right. Well, I mean, that from equal, you mean from essentially equality of opportunity to equality of outcome. Equity is something I don't want to. Get. Yeah. Well, so, but I mean, like, yeah, like, like these, these changes are, are very small and subtle and all fall within the range of what you could easily argue is like academic freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of of belief, right? But but ultimately if if we accept uh these things, for example, if we accept China's new definitions of its territory, then gradually they can just keep expanding that until they have the legal right to block or tax a major part of international shipping. Um, if we accept China's definition of human rights, and other countries do, gradually people will lose the right, the human right to you know freedom of speech and, and religion and, and freedom of movement. I mean, uh, just look at what's and, happening in Hong Kong. Right, and it will be replaced by this definition that means you're allowed to make money. And 
like that's horrible as an outcome. But like, yes, we can be free to talk about it. But once that communist idea like gets in there and changes our definitions, then it's actually already like halfway to being completely screwed up for us. I mean, I was just thinking about Hong Kong, too. And uh, we're recording this on June 16th, which is the third anniversary of the when two million people marched in the streets. Oh, in my Hong gosh, Kong. I remember that day. Uh, yeah. And I was looking through some of my photos from that day of just like we were standing on that flyover over Lockhart on Lockhart Road, like across the street from the McDonald's and just mm -hmm. seeing like the masses of people coming towards us. And I was looking at them and I was like, oh, maybe I'll post some of these photos. And then I was like, I can't post anything that has people's faces in it. Mm -hmm. um, and my favorite video or photo I took from that day was just like after the march, uh, we were in Tamar Park and there were just some people hanging around and they were singing this song, uh, this like traditional Hong Kong protest song. It was like a rock song from this band called Beyond. And it's called like, boundless ocean vast skies and they're just sitting there with a guitar and just like singing and somebody's like flying a hong kong flag in the background it's a great shot and i was like i can never post this publicly yeah because you can't do any of that anymore i don't want to get those people in trouble even though they're supposedly not going to be in trouble because this all happened before the national security law but there's i mean the chinese communist party will definitely persecute people for things that they did yeah before that so it's just interesting that like once you get to the point where they do control speech or they do control, like, then you have to make those calculations, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that's that's something that a lot of Americans have a difficult time understanding because things have been so good here for so long, generations. Like, you really are only hearing the warnings coming from, like, people who came from former Soviet countries or people who came here from China of, like, hey, this 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 is really bad. Things can get really bad really quick. Yeah, Hong Kong got really bad so fast. I mean, I think people knew that uh, there could be a harsh crackdown from the Chinese Communist Party, but I don't think anyone would have predicted exactly. That it really yeah. just became another Chinese city. Right, yeah. I mean, I remember people were saying to us in Hong Kong, like some of the, the reporters were like, oh, like maybe they'll send in Chinese troops, right? Or tanks or something. And like, if that had happened, it would have almost, it, it would have been a less horrible outcome in a certain way because it would have been so obvious how horrible it was. But what inst instead they did is like, like it was a modern Tiananmen response where instead of sending and in, in doing things with violence, they did things with peace. And with the law, just like the we rule, were talking the about the- by law. With like the change of human rights with the use of military. It's like, oh, they're creating a legal framework to do all their horrible things. Right, but it's because the Communist Party uses the law as a tool to prosecute the people they want to prosecute. Because yeah. to... it's not law as we understand it. Well, but like like if you look at the way uh, like the Bill of Rights is written in the United States, right? It's like, it, it's, it's not a law, the, it's not like the government gives freedom of speech to people. It's that the, the constitution explicitly forbids the government from abridging free speech. Like well, that's Congress because that has no law abridging. That's blank, because blank, blank. this is a very unique thing about the American system that is pretty much different from any other liberal democracy in the world. That, that our it's, constitution is a basically, a lot of it is sets of restrictions on the government. Well, no, it's the idea that uh, rights come from the divine or from nature, some something transcendent outside of human control. We fundamentally, by the nature of us being human, have these rights, which is very different than everything else where other other countries where it's government uh, give people Right, like even, even the UK, right? I mean, it's essentially the, the crown that's is a monarchy that controls, right? And But they, mm. they give people a lot of rights, right? But it's, and yes, I know it's more complicated than that. I know the blood of asterisks, Shelley. But no, I mean, you're right. We, we we here are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. And that is a fundamental difference of the American system, which is why the Chinese Communist Party hates it so much because when these rights are transcendent and fundamental to the human experience, then you can't 
nudge it by changing the definitions of human rights or changing the definitions of oh, what it sure means. Oh, sure you can. You can say that your rights are just uh, your Western hegemonic well, you know, definition of human rights. That's what you they know. try to do, yeah. yeah. And it might work. And if we give it up. Well, I think it's kind of working in the UN, which is the, yeah. you know, it, if, you, if you look at like, will this actually work? You've already got you know, the UN, you've got China boasting this week about having 70 countries supporting China's position on, you know, what it's doing to the Uyghurs. Well, it's easy to find 70 dictatorships. Yeah. When, there's, when you have almost 200 countries, like you can find seven, like most countries are dictatorships. Yep. Right. We don't know how good we have it. We have it good. We have it good. So let us know how you would fight the communist bandits. Give us some ideas in the comments below. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> See, I, I, Why not? I, are you trying to bring us on the rails, Shelley? We, we're supposed to go off the rails at the end. Do you not realize how every podcast has ever worked? Well, okay. I think there there is room for a legitimate discussion of like, how do you fight this ideology? Because that is something people have struggled with for a long time. Struggled with? Struggled against? Thank you, Matt. No, I just didn't like the way you phrased it. With because, the communist bandits? Yeah, because I, I think I then you're going to have like a stupid number of people being like, murder them. And, you know, remember mm, when we used to- Interesting suggestion, Shelley. When, when, remember when we just had people like saying nuke China in the comments yeah, all the yeah. time and that was really annoying. What, what, okay. are some, what are some ways we can do it without physically hurting innocent people? Well, yes. What? How can we actually fight Chinese communists? Communist ideology, not just Chinese communist ideology. Right, and and not and not like killing people. That's that's like not on the table here for this discussion. Can we agree on that? Okay. Thanks for watching China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. <laughs> and I'm Matt Ganesda. We'll talk to you next time. I was hoping this would be a fun podcast. I thought it was fun. I thought it was great. Mm.